Thank you, dear Hannes, for including me in this really unique celebration. That's really a great, great pleasure to be here. All of you know about the small country in the Caucasus, so I only want to give you a brief overview on Georgia's late history. During the 1990s, the country was shaken by a civil war, which was actually a Russian invasion in Abkhazia and South Ossetia rather than a civil war. The war quickly spilled over to all of Georgia. The result was poverty, hunger, corruption, and organized crime, mostly undertaken by the authorities. When in 2003 the elections were completely falsified, the people demonstrated in large numbers. The only way the Georgian people knew how to change a situation through the centuries was in a revolution. Mikhail Saakashvili led the Rose Revolution. It was the first of the colored revolutions and Georgia's first revolution without any bloodshed. The following reforms that Saakashvili and his libertarian team implemented were successful. In just a few years, the country was rated previously by Transparency International as one of the most corrupt in the world and advanced 100 places. Investors started to take a serious interest in the country and the economy grew in double digit numbers. Of course, this was a thorn in Putin's side because the Russians were always told that the Homo Sovieticus is genetically corrupt and can only survive with a strong dictatorship and corruption as a lubricant of the system. If they see their brothers in Georgia developing their country in a speedy and prosperous way without corruption, with freedom of speech and increasingly stabilizing jurisdiction, it would become a threat to the Kremlin and its system. Putin tested the grounds verbally in preparation of the war in Georgia in 2008. When there was absolutely no reaction from the West, he continued with more and more actions. For example, he shot down a US drone and blamed the West for it. And still, this did not lead to a reaction from the West. Next step was to unlawfully station troops in South Ossetia and Abkhazia where the Russians were actually the peacekeepers. Again, no noteworthy reaction from the Western states, who still called themselves friends of Georgia and its progress towards freedom and democracy. For a long, long time, Putin had prepared his strong lobby among Western politicians and economists and journalists. In Bucharest, at the NATO summit in 2008, in May, Georgia and Ukraine were promised NATO membership but without membership action plan and without a time frame. Therefore, the promise was counterproductive. Putin knew he had to act immediately. He then soon started to attack the Georgian villages in Trinvali region, and Saakashvili had to react to save the Georgians in South Ossetia from ethnic cleansing. With the first shooting from the Georgian side, everybody blamed Saakashvili for having started a war against Russia. The lobbyists did a great job even after the full-fledged war had started. The Western press, and with it most politicians, turned away from the young libertarian government in Georgia. French pr President Sarkozy, who held at that time the EU presidency, finally brokered a six-point agreement between Russia and Georgia. It ended the war with the de facto loss of 20% of Georgian territory, and Russia never fulfilled even one of the six points that they had signed up for. Georgia was Putin's playground, and we all know what had followed. The Crimea, Donbas, I don't want to talk about Syria even, and still no tangible reaction from the West. And the result was now his total miscalculation with the full illegal war in the Ukraine. Back to Georgia. Even after the war, the country continued to develop economically with great speed. Investors were attracted for mainly two reasons. No corruption and a functioning rule of law. Of course, also because of the beneficial geographical position of Georgia, low taxes, minimal bureaucracy, and the ease of doing business. All the neighbors had and do have frozen and not so frozen conflicts 
in all of them, Russia played and continues to play a decisive role. The main goal of the Georgian government and the population was to join EU and NATO. They didn't care about the bureaucracy in, in Brussels or whatever because it was concerning really their, their urge to have freedom and stability in the country. During the second term as a president from 2009 to 2013, Saakashvili's party, UNM, United National Movement, lost in the parliamentary elections in 2012 against the newly built coalition of the Georgian Dream Party. According to the constitution, at the presidential election the following year, President Saakashvili could not run for a third term. The Georgian Dream Party was and is financed by a Georgian-born Russian oligarch, Bidzina Ivanishvili. He owns more money than the Georgian state budget. Neither he had the aim to continue the successful path that the country was taking towards the West, nor did he want to follow democratic ideas or continue the fight against corruption. He was prime minister for only one year and decided then that it was much easier to pull the strings behind the scene. The population believed the lies of the new government to continue the work towards EU and NATO membership. The constitution was continuously changed with the new majority in the parliament. Slowly, nepotism returned. Laws were changed in favor of Georgian Green Party and its interests. Corruption crept back into the system. And the freedom of press disappeared. And this was replaced by 24-7 misinformation through all channels of media. The main argument or program of the Georgian Dream Party was to demonize the former government and to blame it for everything that went wrong in the country, but foremost to discredit President Saakashvili. Elections were falsified using all means, including blackmail and bribery. Today, there are no more free elections. Russia also supports some of the opposition parties. As a result, a constant struggle and no unified opposition. Today, no minister is appointed without the approval of Ivanishvili, and no ministry can take a decision without his consent. That, of course, paralyzes the state. For the first time, more Georgians left the country than the people that settle in. There is a heavy brain drain. The government continues to put political prisoners into jail. The most famous are Nika Gvaramia, the owner of the last opposition TV channel, with very spurious reasons. And former President Saakashvili, the founder of the opposition party United National Movement, on the grounds that he had entered the country by illegal crossing the border. Saakashvili went on hunger strike to raise awareness. He has been incarcerated now for one and a half years and is now in very critical health conditions. Foreign medical doctors from Poland and the US proved that he's so being slowly poisoned. We know all that Putin has a long history of that. On June 23, in 2022, the European Parliament adopted a resolution calling for immediate granting of the candidate status of, for the membership of the EU for Ukraine and Moldova, but for Georgia only the support of European perspective. This is so despite the fact that Georgia had already fulfilled more chapters on their way into the EU than the other two. This brought immediately thousands of Georgians in the street. The young people were especially active. The EU gave Georgia a 10-point plan to fulfill until the end of 2023. Many of the tasks are performed. Two of them the government does not want to touch. One is the de-oligarchization, which of course aims to limit the Russian influence through Bidzina Ivanishvili. The other important points are no political prisoners and freedom of press. On one side, they wanted to show to the voters that they are working towards Europe. And on the other side, they want to force the West to deny the candidate status. Slowly, the population that is with a vast majority, around 80% in favor of becoming a full member of the European family, realizes that the government is lying to them. A few weeks ago, the Georgian dream majority in the parliament passed the foreign agent law in the first reading. This law is copied from Russia to eliminate the foreign support of any Georgian institution 
whether it is a political foundation or a cultural institution or something like that. Immediately, there were tens of thousands in the street to protest. Georgia had not witnessed such numbers protesting in decades, particularly the young people. The government was forced to withdraw the law in the second reading. As a result, the Georgian Green Party forced its members who had voted against the foreign agent law to retire from parliament. The withdrawal is the first visible success for the population to influence the government. However, this is not enough. Georgia will need the help of the Western free countries to find its way into Europe. The Western world has all the tools in its hands to wield influence over Georgian Green's actions, mainly guided by Russia, and it would be not complicated to implement them. Just look at the US. They just sanctioned four corrupt judges, Georgian judges. The reaction of the Georgian Dream government proved theirs to be right. Sanctions do work. If the West would sanction Ivanishvili and just a few other politicians and business persons who are doing their business with Russia personally, there would be no more politically motivated incarcerations. They would avoid putting obstacles in the way of the European integration and there would be a chance of relatively free elections coming up next year. Thank you very much.